Well, hi, everyone. Um, I'm Abby Anstead from The Northerner, and I'm here with Sam Quinones, a best-selling author of the book Dreamland. I was hoping you could start off talking a little bit about your background in journalism. Sure. Just telling me where you've worked and what you've done. Yeah. Um, I went to UC Berkeley and did not major in journalism. I didn't really know what I was going to do when I got to college, or even after I graduated college, honestly. Uh, so I didn't major in journalism, So, um, nor, very importantly, um, most importantly, did I write for the university newspaper or anything like that. It was kind of a, something I got into after I graduated. Uh, and it was after I graduated, I did, did a bunch of internships that I began to think, gosh, this was fun, I like this, didn't have to wear a tie, you know, mm -hmm. it was like kind of nice, right? And, um, and then I got very involved in, in storytelling. Storytelling became really exciting. At first I had no idea wh wh where I would find a story. How do you do that, you know? And little bit by little bit, doing it, but also taking an occasional kind of night class, basically, at a local uh, college while I was uh, driving trucks for a living and stuff around San Francisco. I was in San Francisco at the time. And um, over a period of years, I just kind of, it just became naturally my thing and I really got into it and I began to love it and be excited by it and thrilled by it and never bored and always out doing a different story and all kinds of stories interested me I found. A business story, uh, a crime story, it, it didn't really matter. It was fun to find them, you know, and that's why I, that's st remains the case today. Um, I finally got a job at the Orange County Register in Orange County, California after several years. Uh, I did an internship in Boise, Idaho. I mean, I, I moved all over. Um, after Orange County, I went to Stockton. That was probably the best move I ever made, really. Um, or certainly one of the two best moves I ever made. That I went there to cover cr a crime, and I had never covered a murder. I'd never covered a, a fire. I'd never covered a drug bust or anything like that. In Orange County, I covered mainly politics and, and local development stuff. And, oh man, I, I became addicted to that. I really loved the crime, man. I just like got fully into it and became, I wanted to become the expert outside of law enforcement. I wanted to be the person who knew most about criminal investigations and how homicides are done and bullet trajectories and fingerprints and gangs and all that kind of stuff. And in Stockton was where I realized that I needed to speak better Spanish. My Spanish was almost non-existent, it was so bad. And so I began taking a class in the morning. I worked nights, and I worked, took a class in the morning in, in Spanish to learn Spanish because we were just seeing huge numbers of Mexican immigrants come up to work in the field. Stockton's a rural um, area, farm, farming area. And um, that was the, a, another very good decision, kind of like making myself more marketable, but also opening up a whole area uh, of storytelling that I could not have done before without speaking Spanish, you know, people that I couldn't talk to now. I could talk to and I began to go back and forth to Mexico a little bit and I left the paper and went to Seattle and honestly I really did not like Seattle and that's not a good idea for a boy from California to move to Seattle uh, it just doesn't work um, anyway this boy didn't work um, and I spent about a year and a couple of months uh, there and then I went down to Mexico to study more Spanish but for three months that was my intention three months uh, but I lived with um, a couple, a couple that was uh, a communist, a communist couple in Cuernavaca, which is a south of Mexico City, a lot of language schools. I was living with them, and they were far, far left-wing family. And they had pictures of Fidel Castro on the wall, and uh, Sandino, and they had Che Guevara, and Lenin, and all this stuff from the kind of the, the heroes of the left. And um, here was this American Yankee guy, you know, in their midst and stuff. It was kind of a weird thing. Um, but in the midst of all that, I found a job at a magazine in, uh, in Mexico City, and I went home to Seattle, and I quit my job there. It was basically a 95% cut in pay to go to live in Mexico. I was making a pretty good salary, and I was making almost nothing in Mexico, but I was totally in love with it. It was like exciting, and, and then three months, after a year, I'm sorry, in, in, at, the, at the magazine, it folded and I became a freelance writer and I ended up staying for 10 years in Mexico as a freelancer, which is a great way to live in Mexico because you are, um, nobody's your boss. I, I, by then I had been a reporter for seven years and I kind of knew where, my sto where the stories were, I could find them. And um, I, I was writing okay by then, I was writing fairly well by then. 
And uh, I also uh, was spending, uh, uh, making dollars and spending pesos, and that's a, that's a nice way to live. So. so Mexico was great too, it was another great decision really, even though it looked weird uh, financially uh, at first because it, it opened me up to all kinds of amazing stories again. And that's really, uh, in, my, um, in my experience, that's really the thing. You gotta, where, where there are great stories, that's where you wanna be. You know, and Mexico was involved in all kinds of major change at the time. Lots of people coming here illegally, mostly. Lots of political change, cultural change, economic change. It was just fabulous. And, um, and I, did, I wrote two books out of that um, about Mexico and then came back to um, uh, the United States in 2004 after 10 years and wrote for the Los Angeles Times, to come to Los Angeles Times. And it was there, basically, that I um, uh, found the story that would eventually lead me to write uh, Dreamland. Yeah, you talked about finding the story and the excitement behind that. How yeah. did you find this one? How, how uh, did you find Dreamland? Yeah, exactly. I mean, I, I was uh, put on a team to cover the Mexican drug war. Now, I was in L.A., and uh, I spoke Spanish, so they put me, my job was to cover how Mexican drugs were trafficked once they crossed the border. And um, one day, I mean, I was tooling around the Internet, basically saying, what, what story might I do here? Let's see if we can find something. And I come upon a story about Huntington, West Virginia, right, just down the mm -hmm. Ohio, or up the Ohio River, I guess, from here. Um, and a number of people dying of black tar heroin overdoses. And that struck me as weird right off. That, that's the thing about journalism. If you, if you feel something's weird and you don't follow up that hunch, first of all, black tar heroin, in this, in this, I knew about black tar heroin from living in, in Stockton. That was the only kind of heroin they had. And they told me there, you know, this is only on the West Coast. You don't see, I mean, you don't see this west of the Mississippi. That's what the narcs told me. That's what the DEA told me. I mean, there's the, there's a long history of black tar heroin really being west of the United Western United States only. And so, what was it doing in West Virginia? And also, what, why West Virginia? West Virginia has no Mexicans, right? It's only black tar heroin was made only in in this hemisphere. It's only made in Mexico. And why would there be any appetite for heroin in West Virginia? I never thought I never thought of of West Virginia as a state that had a, an appetite for heroin. Um, I thought of heroin as being in Chicago and New York and Baltimore and L.A. and, but even then, not very much. I mean, now that was many years ago. So what was all? Where were all these people dying of black tar heroin in West Virginia for? I mean, that that kind of thing. When you when you are seeing those kinds of questions are are hitting you. As a journalist, you have to act on that. If you don't, you probably should find another job. You know, you should probably find something else to do because. If you can't, if, if all these questions are popping up and you don't try to find the answer, you, know, you're not, you may not be able to find the answer, but you need, need to act on them. You need to try. And so I called Huntington PD and they said, uh, yeah, all, those, all, that, all that heroin stuff that was coming from Columbus. And I called DEA and DEA is it, uh, the one who, a uh, guy there was the one who first told me about all these guys driving heroin around their town and this kind of thing. And then he told me one thing. And again, this is, this is really important. When uh, he told me this thing, he said, um, all these guys who we've been seeing from Mexico, driving heroin around town, selling it like delivery, de like delivery, like pizza. Um, all these folks are from one town, same town. Now, when I lived in Mexico, I knew many towns where everybody does the same job. I knew that this was really common. But they're small towns. It's pla they're places where poor people live, uh, mostly poor. And so the access to education is not so much that you can get, go to school and become something radically different than what your father was, say, or mother was. Um, you, uh, that access to education is not there. So you end up being taking your life trade from whoever's around you, your uncle, your brother-in-law, whatever it happens to be. And so there are many, many, many towns all across the country where everybody does the same job. There's a whole towns of construction workers. There's entire towns of, uh, there's one town I wrote about in my first book, which is an entire town where everybody makes popsicles and they have built a popsicle business model that they have taken all over the country. It's probably the most prevalent non kind of corporate business thing. I mean, far more prevalent than McDonald's down there. Maybe Coca-Cola is the only logo that you see more or less more than the, uh, these popsicle shops. 
but it's an entire town where everybody makes popsicles. There's an entire town that I know of that I've been to several times where everyone is a pimp. And they all pimp these very innocent uh, country girls and turn them out and then uh, ship them to Queens, New York. And uh, that's an entire town. Ghastly little, disgusting little town. But the idea that everybody could be ma doing the same job, that there was a town in Mexico where everyone came here to the United States to sell heroin like pizza, w was completely within the realm of possibility. And so, I, I, so I'm like, what town is that? And he comes back on the phone and says, he says, Tepic. Now, Tepic is the capital city of Nayarit, the state of Nayarit in Mexico. Nayarit's a small state, but, but nevertheless, and Tepic's not one of the larger capitals, but nevertheless, it's 350,000 people. And I knew that a system like he was describing could not possibly have grown up in Mexico in a, in a town of 350,000 people. It's just not possible. It had to be a small, small town. And so he gave me a list of all these guys that they had arrested and put in prison who were still in prison, and I wrote to them all. I wrote, well, I wrote to many of them. I can't remember exactly how many I initially wrote to, maybe 15 or 20. And, um, and one of them got back to me, and he was the one who told me that the town that I wrote about in the book, Jalisco, a little town, 20,000 people uh, in the state of Nayarit, was the town where that, that was doing And that led me to this story of, of her Mex Mexican heroin trafficking. But of course, behind it all was always, you know, well, why would they be able to sell heroin in Columbus? If um, why is there an appetite for it? And that led me to, to the pills. So I really backed into the story. Everybody else kind of comes to the story from the pills first and then heroin. And I was starting with heroin, you know, saying, why are these Mexican heroin guys doing such good business? And, and, and in places I, of the country, I never assumed had a, pro, had a heroin problem, you know? Yeah. Um, can you talk about the style in which you wrote the book? Because uh, I felt as I was reading it, I felt like I was almost watching a movie. You kind Good. of got, yeah, you had me, <laughs> you had me on the edge of my seat, Good. and then it stopped, and you open with the next story. Right. Yes. Can you maybe talk yes. about why it you decided exactly, to do that? It was exactly that was the model. That was trying to do a, um, uh, one of those 1990s blockbuster movies, basically. And uh, but and the reason was this: if you, I felt if I wrote a book about heroin, the topic was such a downer topic and that no one would read it. I really was fighting against the topic. It was such a drag to write about, you know. Um, who wants to know more about heroin? It's such a, you know. But I began to think, okay, I had seen Clear and Present Danger by, with, with Harrison Ford I, uh, like eight or nine times. I've seen Heat with Robert De Niro and, and Al Pacino. I don't even know how many times. Why? I began to analyze why do I keep going back and why do I have to, when I watch the first 15 minutes and I'm hooked and I just go keep watching, right? And I think part of it has to do with scenes and you're setting, being set up to, to watch several stories happening at once or more than one story happening at the same time. And so you're following this story and you're following that story and you're following. And I saw that this book was very well, this topic was very well set up to do that. You had the Mexican guys, you had the history of pain, you had the pharmaceutical uh, companies uh, pushing these drugs as if they were non-addictive. And then you had the pill mills and some other things too. But I mean, those were like the main threads and stuff. And so, um, all I began to realize these are all threads, right? And you just have to weave them. And, and so what ended up happening, if you keep the chapter short, I envisioned each chapter like one of those scenes from a blockbuster movie. So you have like, you know, in those blockbusters, they have like, T -t 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 -t, you know, Langley, Virginia, and Dubai, and you know, like London, and, da -da 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 -da, and, and that sets the stage. And that's originally how I had the book. I didn't have um, in the chapter headings, I didn't have anything but the, the dateline, the, the place, right? Then my wife read it, and she said, um, I know what you're trying to do, but it's going to confuse people. you got to put something else that gives them a hint about what each chapter is about. The dateline's fine, but you need something else. And that, honestly, it's a weird, small little thing, but it saved the book. Because people were allowed to see, oh yeah, this is about that guy who takes heroin to Columbus for the first time. I call him the man. And this is about the doctor in Portsmouth who kind of essentially started the, 
the, uh, the pill mill idea, the business model for pill mills. I call him Liberace in the, in the title, anyway. You know? um, and so people were able to follow the story throughout and, and um, very easily that way. And, but the idea was that if I didn't write it with some kind of gripping cinematic kind of property, that people would lose, who would, lose, who would read 25 page, 30 ch page chapters about heroin? I would not. I'm writing the book and I knew I would not read that. So some other approach needed to be taken and that's kind of how I did. Yeah. Um, how did you make this kind of shift, um, writing as a traditional journalist to writing to be more of an advocate or to get the community engaged or involved or to call attention to this issue? Well, I mean, I didn't think it was much of a shift. I mean, I'm just telling stories. My, I am not an activist. A really important thing to know. I, I am not an activist. I don't go out there and say, um, let's go march on Washington. Or, you know, uh, I write stories. I tell stories. And that's what I do. And that's the point. That's what you need. Uh, and that's activists can use and have used and are using this book. I'm very happy. It's good. That's what they should be doing. They should parents should be out there using that, putting it in the politician's face saying, "Hey, pay attention to this issue because I'm telling you they weren't doing it before that book came out." I know this because I I tried to get people to talk to me about this stuff and it was very difficult. People who were involved professionally were, were would do it. Would t you know, a cop, a public health nurse, th those folks would talk, coroner or what have you, but the parents would not. They, everyone was mortified, you know. And so this book became, um, uh, was very difficult to do. I thought it was basically going to die because nobody wanted to talk about this. I was too shameful, too embarrassing, too mortifying, you know. But um, I don't see that much change. Uh, I mean, I have been trying to become a better storyteller since I became a journalist 30, almost 30 years ago. Every day I try to figure out new ways, you know. That's, uh, that's what I do. And this was um, a book that I really, really believed in the topic. I really believed in the story that I knew that heroin was gonna be a huge problem back in 2010 and not 2009 and 2010, because I had studied these boys from Mexico and how they did their job. And I could see that they were definitely coasting, they were riding that wave of pill, addict, pill addiction, but it just hadn't grown to the point where it was scary enough for people. And, and so I thought this is, a, this is definitely gonna be a story. Um, all, and I realized it was gonna be all across the country because the pills were everywhere. They're in Alabama, they're in Alaska, they're, you know, they're all over. And there were a lot of areas where people were not prepared for, um, for it. And so I had this inkling like, dang, this is, this is gonna be big, this is, a big, this is a big problem and nobody's paying attention to it. Nobody was talking about it politically, uh, public figures of all kinds were not you know, involved in it. And so, um, but, but my, in answer to your question, I, I feel that I, I just, it's just kind of like a natural extension of what I've always been doing, trying to find a story, make it as good as I possibly could, and then, um, and write it, you know, and, and, and then again, not be the activist. It's really important not to be the activist because you have to not, um, you have to be willing to write about everybody with their blemishes, right? And if you take a side, you will miss certain things. You will miss um, the nuances of why people do things. There is not in this story a snidely whiplash, a big bogeyman that everybody can point to saying, bad guy. You know, that's for soap operas, right? L real life is very, very complex and different. And there's a lot of reasons why people do what they do. And when you understand why they do what they do, you can kind of un understand them better. But um, it, it, you, 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 if, you, if, you, if you kind of step back from that, um, you can see their, what, what motivates them. And if you, so, but if you're, if you're viewing them all as the, the, from the point of view of an activist, which is to say, I want a certain thing done and those people who are standing in my way are bad people, which is a natural approach and I don't fault people from doing it. I'm just not that person, you know. I'm a journalist and journalists have to be willing to um, leave their politics at the door 
completely. And I, I try to do that very, very aggressively. Was that difficult for you to do um, no, with the creation be, of this book? No, because because the, the, the stories were, the story was so good. I mean, the story, or powerful. I don't say good in, in, a, in a positive sense. It was, and the story was so powerful. And, and I felt, I have been writing about in very, very, I felt honest terms about Mexican immigration for a long time. I think my two books reflect that basically. Um, so I could write about um, the, the daring of a Mexican immigrant and the jealousy and the cowardice of, of, a, of a person all in the same person because that's who we all are. We've got these roiling, conflicting ambitions and goals and, and motivations, right? And so, you know, when you have all that, it's important to include it. And um, if people go home and want to show off their, their Levi's 501s or their new houses that, that, that they bought selling heroin, that's part of the story. That's not to say that I applaud it. I just am saying this is the story. This is why you have these guys unrelentingly coming here. You can arrest them all you want. They'll still come because they, they know guys who built a house. They know guys who walked around the plaza and every girl in the plaza wants to talk to them. And, that, and so they want to be that guy. I mean, that's a powerful, powerful motivating force. I don't need to, to, I don't, I don't need to say, tut, 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 how terrible they sell heroin. I'm hoping that you're mature enough as a reader to figure out that I'm not saying isn't it wonderful that they're changing their lives by selling a highly addictive, devastating product to, to my countrymen? No, it is not. I'm just trying to get an idea, give people an idea of why this has happened. You can, you can read it for yourself and figure out how you want to view these folks, the pharmaceutical companies, the doctors, the pill mill guys, all of that can be your entire conclusion yourself. Just, it's not going to be mine. I think it works better. It's, it's more um, powerful as a, as a story if, if I let you do that. What do you want the readers to take away from the book? Oh, I, I, I mean, a lot of things. I think um, that, that um, we have destroyed, we've gone a, a fair measure towards destroying a lot of community in this country. And that, that heroin is the outgrowth of that. The final expression of, of destroying community in America is that you get a drug that turns everybody into this solitary kind of uh, narcissistic, self-absorbed um, person, you know? I mean, uh, that uh, uh, one thing I think is clear is that this is a private sector created problem. We've spent the last 35 years that I can count um, uh, applauding the private sector and, and the government and mocking government and, you know, and laughing at it and suing it and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And really the truth is this is an entire pro problem created by the private sector. And I will say this, it's also, the, 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 this problem was fought. The only people fighting this, when all those parents were mortified and ashamed and in their bedrooms crying and could not bear to, to talk publicly about their, their child, their beautiful kid who had just died in a McDonald's bathroom, the only people who were fighting for them and against this scourge were government employees. They were coroners, they were public health nurses, DEA cops, prosecutors, paramedics, EMS folks of all kinds, um, uh, doctors in county hospitals. Those were the folks who were fighting it. Gover everyone got a government paycheck. And they were the ones who, and sometimes for, with no thanks, sometimes being sued or threatened with lawsuits, you know. So to me, there's this, there's this feeling about, about this story that, that, uh, that, is, that is, this is the final result of 35 years of saying that whatever the private sector does is, is wonderful because they're so efficient and they're job creators and government we should laugh at and we should, should insult and we should disparage. And here, this is a perfect example of all the profits go to the private sector, all of them. A few pill companies and dope traffickers basically are getting all the profits from this. And um, all the costs are being borne by jails, courts, all, you and me, every private, you know, it's the public sector that is bearing this cost. And to me, this feels like, um, I don't know, a story for our time somehow that is bigger. I thought it was writing a dope book, right? A crime book, right? That's my kind of background in all this, right? No, it's about who we become as a country and, and 
major priorities that we've allowed to um, fester that should probably not be our priorities. And, and um, heroin is like the poster drug of, what, of all the values that we've fostered for 35 years, in my opinion. Yeah, can you talk about um, kind of why you're here on campus and what you hope people take away from the conversation that you're going to be um, giving to the community later tonight? Sure. Um, well, again, my job is to tell a story. I have found it very interesting and very encouraging and a happy result that around the country, people, organizations, groups, or institutions have been using the book to, to begin conversations about this whole problem. Again, I, I really view myself as a, as a storyteller and I'm not from Northern Kentucky. However, I love the idea that this university is bringing me here to talk about this, to begin a conversation, to open up the university as kind of an avenue for discussing this and for, 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 for dealing with this problem. And um, all of that um, makes a lot of sense to me. And that's kind of what I'm, what I'm doing here. I've, I've done this already. I was just in Albuquerque. A group of people got together, the health department, the health uh, faculty at uh, the university, the DEA, uh, the schools and various places, uh, the county, and to, to begin talking about this problem. And the, the reason that's important, I was in Detroit, same kind of thing happened, and I'm going to be in other places where it's also going. So it, it, uh, Chillicothe, Ohio is one place, uh, Peoria, Illinois is another um, I'm really thrilled that it's really small town America too that seems to be doing this. It's not like New York or you know big big places. It's suburban Detroit, these little suburbs and stuff. But the idea is to um, use the book as a way of opening up, uh, talking more about it, maybe um, discussing new approaches that were before before were politically um, impossible to discuss. Um, that kind of thing is 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 good because again uh, this problem spread because of silence, it, it because of one approach. It's like isolation versus community, right? One approach, one approach to addiction, throw them in jail. One approach to pain, an opiate painkiller, right? Um, one approach to dealing with your. Um, with your pain and grief at having lost a kid, holding yourself up in your house and crying and, and, and just just this horrible depression that comes over you um, uh, at this pointless loss of your of your child. Instead of coming together as a community in a, in a variety of ways, you know? And um, so this, this whole story about a drug that turns everybody into this isolated loner who prefers to be alone and, 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 and away from everybody, uh, it's kind of like the, the final expression of what we've been doing for the last 35 years in this country, in my opinion. Again, it's a story about that or community. And this is, the, this is a pro, an approach of bringing people all together to find not the solution. I really rebel against the idea that there's a solution. People thought there was a solution to our pain problem, and, and it, it was basically firing a fire, blasting a fire hose of pain pills at everybody in every part of the country, no matter what their story, right? That was the approach, and for many years, and that's what got us to this place. So my, my belief is there is not one solution. There are many solutions, and they're small ones, and not one of them is sexy. Hey, I've got the solution for all your problems. It's a pain pill. No, that's not where we're going with this. I think there are lots of little solutions. Each one, each part, each, each entity, or each group, or the school, the health department, the hospitals, whatever, the jails, whatever, each one putting a little bit of, 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 of the, the, the mosaic that is going to be the solution here. And, and a community coming together to fight this, this w very isolating problem. Um, that's how you do it. But there is not one. So anybody, any, anytime anyone asks you, what's the solution? I've been asked that several times. I'm like, there is no so one solution. There are... That's what got us into this problem in the first place. You know, there's many solutions. They're small. Most of them aren't sexy. Most of them are put forth and made to function by by government workers. Frankly, you know, court system, drug courts, all these kinds of things, jail, etc. Um, and that is where um, 
I think we're, we're headed with this. But I'm very gratified, and answer your question, that the book is being used in this way to begin talking as a community about how to address this and not say, uh, well, we have a problem, uh, we have this, the, our answer over here, and we have our, another group says we have our answer, we're gonna be, you know, in, in, when you're working alone, all, all problems seem insoluble. When you bring synergy and leverage uh, all the brain power and the energy together, all of a sudden you have um, some ideas that could be very interesting. Yeah, well, I wanna thank you very much, um, not only for being here with us today, but, but for telling the story. Um, it, it had an impact on me, and I think right. it has impacted our community and maybe our country as a whole. Well, I, I really, I'm so glad that you're, uh, uh, for your interest, it's very, very nice of you, and I really appreciate uh, the sentiment. It's great to be here, and um, I'm very happy that the book has been received like this. Very nice of you. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you.